Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. I'm your host, Hanadi Jordan, Communications Associate at the Bipartisan Policy Center. This week, we're talking about the recently amended U.S.-Canada Safe Third Country Agreement with Verity Stevenson, reporter with the CBC in Montreal, who has been covering the migrants crossing into Canada over the last two years and the effect of the recent changes. So grab your parkas and stay tuned. Our guest this week is Verity Stevenson, a reporter with CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, based in Montreal. Verity, welcome to This Week in Immigration. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to have you here. And joining us for additional commentary is this week regular Teresa Cardinal Brown, who listeners might not know spent several years overseeing the US Canada border relationship while working for DHS as the DHS attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Canada. Welcome back, Teresa. Thanks, Hanadi. Okay, so let's get right into it. On March 24th, the United States and Canada announced the expansion of the 2002 U.S.-Canada Safe Third Country Agreement, called the STCA, which aims to discourage dangerous crossings and encourage the lawful migration pathways. Specifically, the announced changes would apply the agreement to migrants who enter either country between ports of entry. The original agreement only applied to migrants entering at a land border port of entry. Teresa, can you start us off by giving us some background on the U.S.-Canada Safe Third Country Agreement? What does it do? Why was it negotiated? And why didn't apply between ports of entry? Sure. So, um... Let's start with U.S. asylum law. U.S. asylum law says that the United States can't return somebody who's asking for asylum to another country without allowing them a chance to apply here unless, and this is the big unless, the U.S. has a bilateral or multilateral agreement with another country to accept them, and that country has the ability to process a valid asylum claim. They have to have Uh, be a signatory to the international refugee uh, conventions. They have to have an asylum system that's seen as, you know, regular with due process and and a fair ability of people to make that claim. Until the Trump administration, the only agreement the United States ever had was with Canada. And as you mentioned, it was negotiated in the early 2000s after 9-11. And it was negotiated partially as the United States and Canada were kind of grappling with how we would mutually manage the border when we had concerns about terrorists or other people that we didn't want entering our country. Well, we wanted to maintain the ability of Canadians and Americans and others to cross the border pretty freely. So as part of all of those agreements, the Safe Third Country Agreement was was started. And the idea here was that both Canada and the United States believed that each other had you know, really good systems for deciding asylum claims. We were both safe countries for uh, asylum seekers who could be resettled. And that it made sense for us to limit the number of people who might try to come into one country or the other to ask for asylum from the other country. In practice, the Safe Third Country Agreement, almost more often than not, uh, benefited Canada because more more asylum seekers would go north into Canada than come south into the United States. So most of the returns under the Safe Third Country Agreement have been from Canada to the United States. And I think the, the Safe Third Country Agreement in general worked pretty well, I think. Both countries found it useful, at least the governments did. But to the specific question of why it applied only at ports of entry, part of that was because Canada, unlike the United States, doesn't have a dedicated border patrol. In most of the U.S.-Canada border, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP, have responsibility for guarding the border. And it's a corollary responsibility. It's not a primary responsibility. They do it along with their policing of other parts of the government. And so the idea that they would know when somebody had crossed the border between ports of entry and known how long ago they had done it. So the terms of the Safe Third Country Agreement say 
that you have to have entered the other territory less than 14 days ago and asked for asylum within that time period. Well, if somebody crossed between ports of entry and their entry wasn't documented, there was no way of knowing if that 14-day limitation had been met. And so that was, I think, a primary reason why it didn't apply between ports of entry. But I think a, a pragmatic reason is neither country really had a lot of people asking for asylum between ports of entry at that time. It was it was almost never heard of because most people could go to the port of entry and apply there. And it's only been within the last, I think, few years that traveling between ports of entry and seeking asylum between the US and Canada has become much more prevalent. Um, obviously, we've seen something similar on a much larger scale happen at the US-Mexico border, but it also started happening in Canada. And Teresa, uh, what has led to that increased migration between ports? Well, a lot of people would tell you it's because the ports of entry were closed down to asylum. So migrants seeking asylum in Canada knew or were told or found out that if they tried to cross into Canada at a port of entry, they would most likely be sent back to the United States and that this was an exception. And so they tried to take advantage of that exception, much in the way that we saw when the U.S. closed our ports of entry at the Mexican border to most asylum seekers. We saw a huge uptick in the number of people turning themselves into border patrol at the U.S.-Mexico border. Verity, you've been following this issue pretty closely. Can you tell us how this agreement has been viewed in Canada and why it wasn't amended until now? Yeah, it's interesting to hear Teresa's background because I started covering this in 2014, but mostly in 2016, 2017, when word about the loophole spread. So basically after a spike in crossings in 2017, there was this regular flow of people, about 200 or 300 people a month crossing at Roxham Road, which is, um, I can tell you more about it later, but basically an unofficial crossing south of Montreal uh, that became popular as a result of word getting around about this loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement after Donald Trump was elected president in the U.S. in 2016. And so the crossing was closed for nearly two years during the pandemic. And at that point, you know, the agreement wasn't really a political issue. I was briefly, you know, in 2017 when when we saw this spike in crossings, but we didn't really hear about it for several years until this unofficial crossing, quote unquote, reopened up again uh, in the fall of 2021. And at that point, you know, especially in 2022, so in the following months, uh, we really saw sort of these global migration movements pick back up in earnest. Um, A lot of countries' economic and political situations worsened over the pandemic. And so there has been just more people on the move in general. And so in the spring of 2022, we started seeing a new rise in the number of asylum seekers crossing at Roxham. Not quite the 2017 levels, but um, the closest that had been um, seen since then. Uh, So for example, 5,600 claims were processed following regular crossings from July to September 2022. And then that went to 8,000 from October to December. And so most of these people were ending up in Quebec, uh, where since 2018, the government in place in the province, the Coalition Avenir Quebec government, um, has capped immigration numbers. And that government wants to prioritize skilled workers and French speakers. And so the premier, Francois Legault, says there aren't enough resources in the province to properly welcome more than 50,000 newcomers per year. And so what he had been asking is for the federal government uh, to close the loophole in the agreement with the U.S. and effectively close Roxham Road. So he'd been asking for this for a while, basically since he was in power in 2018, but that really those demands really came back in like he was seriously asking for this um i'd say end of 2021 early 2022 so that um yeah so that political pressure really ramped up and the us did agree to renegotiate the deal but closing roxham wasn't really in the us's interest i think teresa you sort of hinted to this because it meant Canada would take even fewer asylum seekers than before. 
I mean, for example, in total since January 2022, there have been 44,000 crossings at Roxham Road. And a lot of advocates for migrants uh, have pointed out that the number is quite small compared to the number of migrant encounters, for example, at the U.S.-Mexico border. In November, according to Pew Research, there were more than 200,000 migrant encounters at the U.S.-Mexico border. So just in comparison, um, the number at Roxham has been quite small. Um, but we are we do have you know a smaller population in Canada, and some would say fewer resources. So uh, yeah, according to to reporting by my colleague Alex Panetta uh, in Washington, this renegotiated deal was actually agreed upon a year ago, um, and uh, yeah, so it's been in the works for a while, and then it kind of happened suddenly. But yeah, so my sense is that it was a lengthy political process and still sort of unclear what's in it for everyone involved. Yeah. And we know that agreement came as a surprise to many who did not know that it had been signed again. Um, Something you mentioned throughout your answer is um, Roxham Road, which leads to my next question. Um, As we know, it's been a growing issue in Canada with a large number of migrants um, passing through the unofficial border crossing to seek asylum in Canada. And I'm curious, why are migrants choosing this route to cross in? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'll I'll start by describing it. Roxham Road, it's a country road in Champlain, New York. So rural New York, north of Plattsburgh. Uh, It continues into, so it runs perpendicular to the border and continues into Saint-Bernard-de-la-Colle on the Quebec side of the border. And there's basically just this ditch that divides the road where the Canada-US border is. And it's basically a convenient place for asylum seekers to cross the border into Canada um, because of that road. And also because there's tree cover, there are homes, uh, it's a residential area, and Plattsburgh isn't far. And it has uh, buses that stop there coming from New York City, Buffalo, Chicago. So you could easily get uh, to this place by bus from anywhere in the States, basically. And just to give you a bit of context about its connection to the Safe Third Country Agreement, since the STCA was negotiated in the early 2000s, We didn't hear much about the agreement. It's really in the months after Donald Trump was elected that we started hearing about the loophole. Um, There was, you know, increased anti-immigrant sentiment was ramping up sort of at that time, especially with comments from Trump about wanting to ban immigration from several countries in the Middle East and Africa. And then at the same time or around that time, uh, he also moved to lift temporary protected status for a number of countries, including Haiti, um, you know, where there has been an especially now worsening political instability. And the country at that time as well was still dealing with the effects of natural disasters. And so basically hundreds of people who had lived in the U.S. for years suddenly faced deportation. And so that's when people started looking to Canada to try to come to Canada from the U.S. And something happened on on Christmas Eve over the holidays that year. Uh, These two Ghanaian men tried to get into Canada walking over the border from the U.S. in Manitoba. And, you know, it was extreme cold at that point. Manitoba is a prairie province. And so there's, you know, you can imagine just unobstructed winds. And they were severely frostbitten and lost several fingers. And so that border crossing started to be seen as really unsafe. Um, And it's a story that shocked a lot of people in Canada. It was quite a big deal at the time uh, because of all the rhetoric around Trump. Yeah, so that border crossing in Manitoba, that place, it's near Emerson, Manitoba. And it's another place that is sort of an easy crossing because there aren't many rivers, uh, there are more roads and so on, but it is open prairie and it is unobstructed winds and it's it's winter six, seven months a year there. I mean, in Quebec as well, but you just have less of that wind and and also more cities around um, Roxham Road. So basically when that story happened, it shocked a lot of people in Canada. The fact that asylum seekers would take that kind of risk just to get here. 
And so not long after that, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau sent a tweet about how Canada's doors were open to people fleeing. Uh, He said persecution, terror and war. And so what we know is that a combination of all these factors and growing global migration movements at that time and currently led to word getting around among people seeking asylum, that one of the ways to claim asylum in Canada was to get over the land border outside of official ports of entry, especially if you had been through the states to get here. Uh, And so that's how Roxham Road got to be seen as the more safe uh, way of getting in, uh, safe, unofficial way of getting into Canada. The migrants who did choose to cross through Roxham, what happened after they crossed and how are they generally welcomed in Canada? Yeah, so it's it's been a process that has evolved over the past five, six years. But basically what it looks like or what it ha- and what it has looked like before the renegotiated STCA is that asylum seekers are briefly arrested by Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Uh, so they're briefly arrested um, on a technicality in order for authorities to register their identities, do background checks. And the loophole in the STCA meant that once you'd made it across uh, the physical border, you could claim asylum. And so they also became um, they also began their claim in that process. And after they were after that, um, they were taken to a shelter nearby for a couple of days and then either sent to a shelter or a ho- or a, even a hotel in Montreal. They're not in the hotels for for more than 14 days on average. So what happens after they arrive is uh, they have to get their refugee applications in, their work permit applications as well. And then while they wait for these processes, they're eligible for basic welfare. But they do have to, you know, after 14 days in a shelter or a hotel, find their own apartment, um, figure out food. Uh, so that's, you know, organize, organizations help with that. But Basically, after 14 days, technically, they're on their own with the the welfare. One of the issues that we're seeing now is that it can take more than a year to get a work permit, which I think is also an issue in the U.S. It can be harder to find work here um, under the table. I know that this is, you know, this is actually one of the ways where asylum seekers have tried to supplement uh, their their welfare because of inflation. Um, But that's a that's maybe another thing. But yeah, so that's what happens after people arrive. Well, Teresa, um, what changes have been made to the safe third country agreement since the original version was passed? So the the primary change, uh, as I think we've all been saying, is that the agreement now applies to people who arrive between ports of entry. And I think one of the things that enabled this is the fact that both on the U.S. side and on the Canadian side, there is more of a reception Uh, And so since especially at Roxham Road and a few other places, the RCMP essentially was waiting there because they knew people were going to be crossing that 14 day and they've been registered and we know who they are. um, That 14 day requirement under the original safe third agreement could be met. And so I think that there was a higher confidence that there that both countries would be able to prove when somebody crossed for eligibility under the safe third agreement. I think that. The, the other thing to kind of be aware of is that um, it now does work both ways. And just before the announcement was made, um, the United States saw an uptick in uh, other nationalities coming south. Uh, now, still it's disproportionately going north, but um, a big increase, at least by U.S.-Canada border standards, of migrants coming south. And uh, a lot of those were Mexican citizens, but a few other nationalities as well. So there was sort of a U.S. interest in saying, OK, well, if they're coming and asking for asylum here, we do want to be able to return them to Canada to seek asylum there. I still believe it probably disproportionately uh, benefits Canada to be able to send more people south than the U.S. can send north. But I think it also went along with the Biden administration's announced intention at all of our land borders to manage migration through sort of a combination of enforcement, uh, restrictions on asylum, but then other legal ways that people could apply to come. And and that's one of the things that got announced was that Canada would open up, I think it was 15,000 new legal ways for migrants to come to Canada. 
The changes uh, were first made known because the U.S. published a regulation in the Federal Register the day before Biden went to Ottawa to meet with Prime Minister Trudeau. What did those regulations say? And in your view, what was the big surprise in them? So the regulations were a joint Department of Homeland Security and Department of Justice regulation. And that's because asylum in the United States is both managed at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services by those who apply affirmatively for asylum there and in the immigration courts, which still reside at the Department of Justice when somebody applies for asylum as a defense against deportation. So the regulations were a joint set of regulations, and they basically said how the agencies would interpret the the safe third agreement for these new arrivals, how it would be documented, what the exceptions to sending somebody back across the border would be, how quickly it had to be done, who was responsible for what part of it. That was the summary of the the regulations. But the big surprise in there was the regulations clearly stated that they were implementing an agreement that had been signed in March and April of 2022. So the big surprise to everybody who wasn't inside one of the governments was that they had already agreed on these changes more than a year ago. And here we were ready to implement. And the other surprise was not only we were going to implement it, we were going to implement it literally 24 hours later. Uh, it, was pub- it was posted for pre-publication on Thursday, Friday formally put in the Federal Register to be implemented as of 12.01 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, so, but I think those were the two big surprises that came out of that regulation. Well, Verity, how have these changes been received in Canada, both politically and the government and publicly amongst Canadians? In the immediate aftermath, especially in Quebec, uh, the changes were actually sort of viewed by politicians, even in media, in some cases as a success, kind of like tying a neat bow on what had been seen as a bit of a political impasse. But what happened is, you know, as you as you mentioned, that agreement came into effect very quickly after it was announced over a weekend as well. And once reporters got to the border and saw that there was, um, you know, no resources in place to deal with this sudden change, I think the narrative changed slightly at that point. Point. I was there over the, that weekend and we saw that these busloads of asylum seekers were continuing to arrive in Plattsburgh in the days following the change. Uh, and these were people who had been in many cases traveling for months, uh, thousands of kilometers, a dozen countries. Many had spent their savings. And so they were not only really shocked, but um, this is rural New York that they're arriving to. And so there aren't really any shelters, resources in place for migrants and almost no public transit. So people were really scrambling to figure out where to go, uh, how to afford getting there. And so that's on top of that disappointment of hearing that Canada is no longer a possibility for most of them. And many people also didn't realize that Well, many people wanted to try anyways to go to the border because they weren't seeing that much of a change. The RCMP officers were now pointing to a new sign that said it is illegal to cross um, into Canada here and you may be turned back into the States. But apart from that, they were still taking them into this processing warehouse that had been there all along. And so people still wanted to try their chances. It's just that many of them ended up being detained for several days and then effectively being released back into the United States. And what a lot of them didn't realize is that once that happens, you're technically not allowed to claim asylum in Canada ever again. Um, And so there was a lot of misinformation going around. A lot of um, people who did not know about these changes were not informed of the risks of trying to cross anyway. Politically speaking, um, you know, this happened over a weekend. So while there was less of a celebratory tone at that point, it was still sort of seen as something that would die down. And already we have seen a lot less people trying to cross at Roxham. Local residents who'd been 
sort of complaining about the traffic of people in cabs. Um, they seem to be appeased, but then others are worried they're going to be seeing more and more people trying to cl cross clandestinely. Um, already that weekend, one woman uh, in the area saw a family get arrested by RCMP in her driveway. Uh, and local advocates have said that in the long term, we're probably just going to be seeing more people taking risks along this nearly 9,000 kilometer border. Um, and Teresa, you were mentioning people, you know, there being an increase in traffic going south of the other side. I mean, two men died in the area over the winter trying to get to the States. And so what advocates are are worried about is that these situations are going to is what we're going to start seeing um, of people going northbound as well. You mentioned an, an uptick in clandestine crossings and uh, and migrant deaths from immigrants who are trying to claim asylum, but are now taking more dangerous routes. So is it fair to say that we've already seen a way that this is impacting migration by making these routes a little bit more dangerous for migrants? And have we seen any decline in the number of migrants who are crossing since this agreement took effect? So we're definitely seeing a decline in the number of, of asylum seekers crossing. The deaths that we saw in recent months are of people trying to get to the States. But what advocates have said is that, okay, well, maybe this is something that could happen to people going northbound. And so they're seeing this as, um, you know, what could potentially happen more frequently as both sides of the border are sort of hard to get across. There were uh, two families that died um, recently trying to get into the States by boat um, in Aquasasne and and uh, upstate New York. It's a path that's that's quite well known, that part of the St. Lawrence River. So, you know, people don't think that it had anything to do with, with the change in the STCA. Uh, but once again, they're pointing to it as, okay, well, could this happen going the other way, basically? Well, that leads right into my next question, which has to do with deaths in the St. Lawrence River. Um, you know, many are calling for the agreement to be dismantled following the death of eight people attempting to cross into the U.S. illegally from Canada, whose bodies were found in the St. Lawrence River just days after the changes went into effect. And critics are arguing that the agreement would likely result in refugees and migrants taking greater risks, as you just mentioned, trying to cross the border, which would lead to more deaths like those that we've seen. Um, and so what are some of the other key criticisms of the safe third country agreement that you are hearing in Canada outside of um, fears of an uptick in migrant deaths? So the agreement is basically an understanding, as Teresa was saying, you know, that Canada and the U.S. have such similar immigration systems that an asylum seeker in the U.S. has the same chances of having their claim accepted than in Canada. But what a lot of experts and lawyers um, and also advocates, of course, that I've spoken to have said that they say the U.S. has different standards in, in terms of some forms of discrimination. And that's actually one of the arguments in a challenge to the STCA that's currently awaiting a decision at the Supreme Court of Canada. A lot of people were also surprised that Canada went ahead with this renegotiation when uh, the Supreme Court could, in fact, find the agreement itself to be unconstitutional. Um, another criticism of the agreement is that it kind of puts Canada in this position of saying, not in my backyard, uh, when in fact the number of asylum seekers crossing into Canada is quite small compared to the US or countries in Europe like Germany. And another thing that they're saying is that one of the advantages of a place like Roxham, or some have said, you know, if refugees were accepted at regular border crossings or ports of entry, is that Canada knows their identities, uh, conducts background checks, and so on. So, so there's sort of an awareness of who's coming into the country in that way. But for people crossing clandestinely under the new agreement, if they're caught within 14 days, they could be sent back to the States. And so advocates say there could be a lot of people going underground as a, as a result of this and for extended periods of time, potentially. Well, Teresa, what criticisms are we hearing on the U.S. side of things? I mean, Verity's broken down sort of the concerns and from Canada. What are we hearing in the States, both publicly and politically speaking? 
So as you can imagine, since everything around immigration is polarized in the United States, the responses are polarizing too. I would say that much like in Canada, a lot of human rights and refugee and immigration advocates are arguing that these kinds of agreements just result in immigrants taking more dangerous routes, uh, more clandestine routes, putting their hands in the, their selves in the hands of, of smugglers, uh, having to go underground, um, and just making them much more vulnerable uh, when all they're trying to do is seek safety. So I think that's that's sort of the primary criticism you hear in the United States. I also think that in light of the Trump administration's attempts to create similar safe third country agreements with countries in, in Central and Latin America, there's been a revisiting of sort of the US-Canada safe third country agreement. And in the context of all of that, should we even have such agreements? And I think those criticisms, primarily, as I said, are coming from human rights advocates, immigration and, and refugee and asylum advocates. On the other side, I think for immigration hawks, it's sort of this disproportionate, what does the U.S. get out of it, right? Um, if more migrants are going to Canada and Canada is just sending back here to be deported, most of them, because even if they do apply for asylum, our asylum grant rates are relatively low, then there are responsibility and our costs to manage and, and deport. And we do have a lot smaller border presence along the northern border, even though the border itself is twice as long as the U.S.-Mexico border. But historically, the numbers of irregular crossings at the U.S.-Canada border have been minuscule. I mean, small percentages of what we see at the U.S.-Mexico border. So um, even though there's a lot fewer border uh, patrol officers and, and stations along the northern border, it hadn't been that big a deal. But if more people are going to be sent back, then is our infrastructure up to that? So I think those are some of the critiques that you hear on, on the U.S. side about the Safe Third Agreement. And again, I think that uh, some of this is, you know, the comparative to what's happening on the U.S.-Mexico border. I mean, I think it bears to be seen how many people are returned under this, where they are from, whether they will seek asylum in the United States, because if they do seek asylum, then we have to give them the same opportunity as somebody who comes across the U.S.-Mexico border, at least right now. But as I noted, many of the migrants that have been coming at least between ports of entry on the southbound direction have been Mexican migrants who aren't asking for asylum. And so they can be very quickly uh, deported under expedited removal. Now, some other nationalities, I believe some of these people who died in the St. Lawrence were, were from other nationalities as well. And it remains to be seen what they would have asked for if they had arrived. Um, you know, the choice of a migrant to seek safety in either the U.S. or Canada probably has a lot of criteria to it, right? One is, where am I most likely to, to obtain protection? I will say that Canada is much more generous in offering benefits to asylum seekers. The United States can take a very long time to grant somebody work authorization. You can't ask for work authorization until six months after you've applied for asylum. And the way our process is completely backlogged, it may be a year or two before you actually get to that point. We don't offer any sort of welfare to asylum seekers at all. They're not eligible for any public benefits whatsoever. And so it's probably a lot harder in that sense. It may be easier to find work under the table in the United States than in Canada. I can't really speak to that, but it's a little bit more challenging. However, if you have family or relatives in the United States that you're seeking to join, then it may be you, you may prefer to come to the United States. So it's all individualized decisions. And I think the politics of this, I think in some respects, uh, the Biden administration will see this as a victory, particularly given that Canada has agreed to open up more pathways for migrants legally as a result of this agreement. I think they also got Canada's agreement to help a little bit more with some of the commitments under the LA Declaration in Central and South America. So I wouldn't say the US gave away the store for nothing. I think we did probably get some things and probably some things that aren't public. Um, I think that's that's to be borne in mind whenever you see public announcements of diplomatic agreements, there's a lot that you never see that are agreed to as well. That's an excellent point. But I, I was something I want to go back to is, um, you know, these concerns over migrants taking more dangerous paths. Um, what steps, if any, are the U.S. and Canadian governments taking to mitigate some of these more dangerous crossing paths? The Canadian government said that they would increase surveillance of the um, 
of the land border. That's the main thing that they said, that the RCMP would increase patrols. And so, you know, does this mean, okay, a greater burden on on first respond, responders, sometimes in small communities? We don't know. It's so hard to say, you know, how many people will try to do this and what rescues will look like or uh, apprehensions and so on. But so far, all we've heard is really increased surveillance and patrolling. Got it. So a lot of this still needs to play out. And Teresa, the U.S. government, what have they committed, if anything, to helping mitigate some of this? Well, the, the public commitments are just that they have returned some of the Border Patrol agents that have been redeployed from the U.S.-Canada border to the Mexican border back to the Canadian border. So they're they're building back up the, the personnel up there. I think like the Canadians, uh, more surveillance, probably a lot more communication between the border officials on both sides of the border. Um, I think one thing that's very different along U.S.-Canadian border than from the U.S.-Mexico border is just the level of intense, not just coordination and communication, but collaboration between uh, the border agencies, uh, law enforcement agencies on both sides of the border um, on everything from migration to criminal activity to smuggling to investigations, you name it. We have very close law enforcement relationships uh, with many law enforcement entities in Canada that I think they'll probably re-up uh, some of those to to try to um, manage what's happening here. But I think like Verity, we haven't seen or heard a lot of other public statements of how uh, these things might be mitigated. I do believe that for the U.S. government's perspective, um, finding more lawful pathways for people to come is their alternative. I mean, the agreement is an attempt to manage the flow of migration and enforce the use of, of lawful ports of entry. But are there alternatives to this policy? Have other people recommended of a different sort of agreement that the U.S. and Canada could take up to still achieve the same goal through different means? What have you been hearing, Teresa, if anything? You know, it's interesting. I would say, you know, if, again, if you ask the advocates, it's let everybody across and let them have their time to apply. Um, I think that's not manageable. Um, you know, Verity said it, even though the numbers are quite small compared to what's happening with the U.S.-Mexico border, Canada is a country with a tenth the population size of the United States, um, a lot more land mass, but a much smaller population, smaller governmental size. And for Canada, 40,000 immigrants uh, is quite a lot to handle. And Verity already mentioned that, that it created backlogs and delays in their adjudication systems, much the way the arrival of, you know, 2 million immigrants along the U.S.-Mexico border created backlog delays in the U.S. asylum systems. So I think those are real concerns. Um, And for Canada and the U.S., at the moment, the number one concern is how do we mitigate new people going into those already overburdened systems? So I think for the moment, the priority is reducing the number of people asking for asylum in either country. And a lot of people have uh, negative views about that as a strategic priority. But I really think at the moment that is a priority, just trying to manage the numbers because the systems can't manage anymore, right? They're, They're just collapsing under their weight. And it's creating additional difficulties, both for the migrants that are waiting Uh, for work authorization or for decision on their case, and the communities that are hosting them. And I think this is a growing challenge, not just to the United States and Canada, but other immigrant receiving countries around the world. As we've kind of mentioned, these are our local aspects of a worldwide phenomena in global migration that's happening right now. Thanks, Teresa. Um, We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back to continue learning more about the STCA. Okay, and we're back. Verity, can you speak to some of the legal challenges that have been brought against the STCA in Canada? You mentioned that there is a a case before the Supreme Court. um, And what are the outcomes of these challenges thus far? Yeah, well, so that's that's still pending, but I can tell you a bit about how it got to the Supreme Court. 
So the most recent um, challenge was in the summer 2020, where these groups, including Amnesty International and the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, along with a couple others, they launched a, ch- a challenge in federal court um, and to the Safe Third Country Agreement. And at the time, uh, the federal court sided with the advocates. Uh, it ruled that the agreement violates Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada, which protects an individual's right to life, liberty, and security of the person. But the following spring, the Federal Court of Appeal, because government lawyers appealed this decision, uh, so the Court of Appeal sided with the federal government, they set aside the decision, and so that's really what paved the way for the arguments before the, the Supreme Court. And the federal government has argued that there are many protections for refugee claimants in the U.S. legal systems um, and that claimants sent back from Canada can access those protections. And right now, well, those arguments were heard in October 2022. And so we're still waiting for the court to uh, hand its decision down on, on that case. So the fate of the agreement still remains to be seen. Absolutely. Teresa, As we've mentioned throughout, this deal was a big surprise to many in the immigration world. How did both parties manage to keep it so quiet and and why did they? What was the reasoning behind this surprise announcement? Well, how they managed to keep it quiet is a big, I think, question. Uh, You know, we live and work in Washington, D.C. that leaks like a sieve. Uh, I don't know if Ottawa has the same reputation. (laughs) Uh, And we didn't hear anything. Um, But interestingly enough, I think that what what we did hear for the year and the months leading up to it from the Canadian government and the U.S. government was this sort of, they, let's put it this way, they left the perception that it hadn't been done yet. And I don't think anybody out and out lied. I'm not going to accuse anybody of that. But they certainly allowed that perception to persist, especially in Canada, where, as you've already heard Verity say, the premier of Quebec, which is like the, the equivalent of a state governor here, was railing on their prime minister Trudeau over this. Why haven't you pressed the United States? Why haven't you gotten the safe third agreement? He was taking blow after blow after blow politically on this. And and even the US ambassador, like the few days before Biden went up there, went on national TV in Canada and sort of indicated that, uh, you know, we have a lot of things we need to talk about. Like he didn't say it wasn't done, but he didn't say it was either. It wasn't a priority, right? He said it wasn't a priority. Now, there's a lot of ways to read that. Maybe it wasn't a priority because it was already done. Realistically, I think one of the reasons that it took so long, and and I think this is just a bureaucratic reason, as somebody who was in government and negotiated bilateral agreements between the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Canada, the, the Beyond the Border Agreement when I was there, you can agree on something, and that doesn't mean you can immediately do it particularly when you're talking about international agreements, both countries may have uh, requirements under their laws and constitution of what it takes to make that agreement binding or formal. I know that many agreements that uh, the United States signs are what we call executive agreements. So they're within the president's authority to conduct foreign policy. They're not formalized by, as a treaty, so they don't require congressional agreement. And so the president has a lot more leeway to kind of sign some of those things. Some things, those same things in Canada maybe do require parliamentary assent or, uh, you know, treated more seriously as a, as a treaty. In this case, I think there were also very significant operational issues especially since it appears they didn't want to let on that this was going to happen until it happened. And I think you asked, why did, why did they keep it secret? I think predominantly it was, if it had been made known that in a month's time, the border will be closed, you would see multiples of thousands of people going across that border as quickly as they could while it was still open. And that would have created even more of a problem on the Canadian side and and probably on the U.S. side as well. So I do think that that was a primary reason why they didn't want to announce that this was done or had been done. Also, I think that there were probably a lot of details about how, okay, how do we track this 14 days? How does each side have documented? And on the U.S. side, because we had to issue regulations. And I will tell you, the regulatory process in the United States 
is not quick. It is not simple. It is not easy, especially if you hope that regulation will stand a court challenge. And because there were two federal departments involved in making this regulation, and oh, by the way, those federal departments were also doing a separate regulation on asylum, what we're calling the asylum transit ban or the restrictions on asylum at the border, it probably took a long time to get that done and for this bilateral negotiation about how it would all get done. That having been said, when the president travels somewhere to meet with a foreign leader, there is immense pressure to have what are called deliverables, something they can agree to and announce. And so however long all of that process was taking leading up to the visit, I am 100% sure that in the weeks leading up to the visit, there was triple down effort to try to get a final agreement and get everything in place so that it could be announced. And so while the governmental agencies may take their time otherwise, when the White House comes in and said, nope, the president is going to announce this, you better have it ready, they will find a way to get it done. (laughs) And I think that's you know, the best way to do it. And kudos to Verity's colleague, Alex Panetta from CBC, who, you know, very quickly, because he was surprised as all the rest of us, researched the story of, of how that happened. But I think the the reality is that, you know, agreements can be signed. Implementing them takes a lot longer, uh, depending on the, the complexity. Uh, but, you know, you get the president involved and things can move quickly. Well, Verity, how has the agreement affected relations between the U.S. and Canada? Has it bolstered and strengthened it in any way? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know how well pleased I am to answer that because I'm not, I don't report so much on on the politics, the relate, the, the, uh, the relationship between Canada and the U.S., but I think that it's been seen by many as solidifying that relationship, um, especially because of the fact that people were aware that this was, you know, maybe not a priority for the states, maybe not in the state's interest. And then so for all of a sudden it to happen and I think was sort of seen like, oh, okay, well, then maybe we do have more of an ear than we thought we did on the U.S. side. Uh, That's the main, that's the sense that I get. Teresa, would you add anything to that? As somebody who's worked on U.S.-Canada issues for a very long time, and we interviewed my colleague Chris Sands uh, from the Woodrow Winslow Institute about this before the uh, after the National North American Leaders Summit, too. The relationship between Canada and the United States is one where I think very, very frequently Canada feels like it's not getting the attention it deserves from the United States. Uh, I mean, Canada shares the longest land border with the United States. It's a, you know, a, a, a free market democracy, much like the United States. We share, you know, one of the two recognized national languages of Canada. You know, we share sports leagues. <laughs> we, we have so much in common. We share a North American defense. They're our number one trading partner. And yet so often I feel like Canada feels like the U.S. just doesn't give it a lot of attention. And from the U.S. side, that's probably true, but it's also true that the U.S. government tends to focus on countries with which we have more problems. And the U.S.-Canada relationship, for the most part, runs pretty well on autopilot. And so there doesn't need to be a lot of high-level attention to get things done, which is why I think when there is that high-level attention, it can move things a lot faster. So I think from the U.S. side, a couple of things. As I mentioned, I think what the U.S. gets from this is Canada's recommitment post the Los Angeles Declaration um, and the Summit of the Americas to work with the United States on engagement in the hemisphere on the broader migration issues. I think that it was probably the most important thing that the United States got from this visit. And if the safe third agreement was the price of getting that, that's probably all to that's fine. I think that it probably was seen that Biden and Trudeau had maybe a little bit of a prickly relationship because they, you know, Biden hadn't made Canada his first foreign visit, which is something Canadians take a lot of stock in. Although Biden and Trudeau had met at least half a dozen or more times on on one to one basis on the side of other multinational um events that they were at. So it's not like they didn't talk. Trudeau was one of the first people that talked to Biden after he won. So they talk on a regular basis, but they didn't make the visit. And that that symbolically matters. I think at the, like I said, I think at the end of the day from the United States, 
this concentrated period of attention on Canada is going to pay dividends for what we hope to do on migration hemispherically. And I think that's probably the the most important takeaway from the U.S. side. There's one thing I, I would add is just that um, that the, some of the criticism that I've heard on this is that it's it's sort of a continuation of Canada mimicking some U.S. policies. And so some people have compared this to policies like some of Biden's border policies, like Title 40. Two or Title Eight, and also the the parole process. I don't know if, if you've heard of that. Just um, to prevent people coming by boat, and then, as you know, to make up for for making it difficult for people to claim asylum um, at the land border, uh, offering regular paths to immigration. But a lot of people that I've spoken with say, well, that sometimes that's just not possible for people, and so. You know what are what about the people that are so so desperate that they are taking these means to get into the country, and so yeah, so I think that that there, the, some of the criticism has been well maybe is this just Canada mimicking U.S. policy basically? Yeah, and and the, by the way, those are the same criticisms that Biden got for those policies from folks in his own party in the United States. So. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, one of the things I take away from that is it's hard to be a national. Indeed. <laughs> I do not envy. Certainly not my dream job. <laughs> well, thank you both for sitting down and joining us today to talk through all of these topics. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. And that's it for our show this week. One last reminder to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform, and share it with your friends and colleagues. You can also find more information on all of the issues we discuss here on the show at bipartisanpolicy.org immigration. You can follow the Bipartisan Policy Center on Twitter at BPC underscore bipartisan, you can follow Teresa Cardinal Brown at BPC underscore T Brown. For feedback or questions, you can contact us by emailing immigration at bipartisanpolicy.org. I'm Hanadi Jordan. This week in immigration was created and executive produced by Teresa Cardinal Brown. This week's episode was written by Hanadi Jordan, Natalie Butler, and Teresa Cardinal Brown. Our audio editor is Joshua Joe. The executive producer of BPC Podcasts is Lucy Manning. See you next time on This Week in Immigration.